Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, in addition to the team from the Department of Health, uh, which of course you know is led by Commissioner Judy Persicelli, Dr. Christina Tan, and Assistant Commissioner Chris Newworth, uh, and State uh, Colonel of the New Jersey Police, Pat Callahan. Today we're also joined by Secretary of Higher Education, Zakia Smith Ellis. As, no, as uh, Governor Murphy announced earlier today, uh, we have received eight new presumptive policy, po positive test results since yesterday's briefing. Thankfully, at this time, there are no further deaths that have been reported related to uh, coronavirus. Thankfully, at this time, um, Commissioner Persicelli will be able to give greater detail uh, on these cases in, in just a moment. Secretary Smith Ellis will discuss guidance that has been given to our institutions of higher education to protect their students, their faculty, and staff from the threat of infection. Chief of Staff of the Department of Education, Kelly Ledette, is also available with us today to respond to questions regarding responses uh, in our public school districts. Today, New Jersey will be receiving $14 million in federal grants from the CDC to assist our ongoing efforts. We urge residents to continue to practice those protocols that we've uh, been uh, voicing uh, to protect ourselves and others because we all have a role to play uh, in preventing and slowing down the further spread of uh, COVID-19. And to be clear, if you are feeling ill, stay home and call your regular health care practitioner. Going to work or school, sick, even with a cold or a seasonal flu, only increases the chances that you will pass that illness on to friends or co-workers. Uh, now I'm going to turn the briefing over to Commissioner Persichelli. Good afternoon. Uh, today we tested uh, 22 specimens. As reported, eight returned positive. The positive cases are four from Bergen County, two from Middlesex County, and two from Monmouth County. Three are female, five are male. They range in age from 17 to 66 years. The investigation of these cases have just started, so contact tracing is not available at this time. However, we do know that two of these cases do not have exposure to COVID-19, either a confirmed case of COVID-19 or travel from an area that has had community spread of COVID-19, so that's two cases. We now have a total of 23 positive cases. We've tested at the state lab a total of 80 cases. 57 have returned negative. 23 have returned positive. As I sit here right now, we have 37 persons under investigations which suggests that they will be having their specimens collected and those specimens will be sent to our lab today. We have received 20 of those specimens and those tests are underway as we're sitting here. 17 of those cases are awaiting the specimens. I wanna talk about the concept of uh, community spread. Simply put, community spread is defined as person-to-person -person transmission without exposure to a confirmed case or a nexus to an area where community spread is identified. We're looking at all of our cases as the contact tracing comes in to, assume, uh, to assure that there are a majority of cases that have a confirmed exposure. For those that do not have a confirmed exposure, we will be putting them under further investigation. 
You may ask me why, so I'll answer that question before you do. The reason being, community spread indicates that the coronavirus is amongst us. And we have an expectation that that may be the case. So although I do not have that analysis today, which could point us in the direction of community spread, we are stepping up our mitigation strategies in selected areas. Today there was a meeting with our psychiatric facilities to support their preparedness activities. Additionally, we have instructed our facility, our psychiatric facility in North Jersey, to restrict all outside activities and to screen and restrict visitors where it is appropriate. That facility is adjacent to counties that have positive cases. CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, published guidance last evening for long-term care facilities. We are advising long-term care facilities to actively screen and restrict visitations to, to all that want entry into a long-term care facility. The reason being, if you have followed what has happened in Washington State, this is our most, one of our most vulnerable populations and we must protect them. Additionally, we're in conversation with our specialized pediatric residential facilities. As you know, those facilities take care of the most vulnerable pediatric populations. We're instructing those facilities to restrict all outside activities and schooling for, these, for this population and to make the necessary preparations for their children to receive the required education in their facility. We do not want these vulnerable children leaving the facility. Today we hosted a call with local public health officials to identify their needs so that contract tracing for identified cases by our lab can proceed expeditiously. Our physicians today have met with the Board of Medical Examiners and they have plans to meet with the New Jersey Academy of Family Physicians this week for guidance on managing patients who seek care from them. For mitigation interventions, such as widespread school closures, canceling of events and controlling sporting events, all of that will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Our guidance right now is to encourage people to limit those types of activities as much as possible. Our lab is busy testing specimens. We have the capacity at our state lab right now to test 400 specimens. In order to fulfill that requirement, we have added new staff and additional equipment. Additionally, we're hoping that Hackensack University Medical Center will be brought online to also assist us with the testing. As I've said in the past, this is a rapidly evolving situation. Our goal is to give you as much information as quickly as we can where appropriate. Our mission is to protect the health of the residents of, of New Jersey by stopping or controlling the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, we'll um, take questions. Yes? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Secretary of Higher Education, Zakia Smith-Ellis is with us. And as you know, she's been working in tandem with all the higher ed institutions and uh, she has a uh, update for you. So I will just do brief remarks. Okay, I will do brief remarks before um, I hand it back over to the Lieutenant Governor, who I know will field questions. Um, I want to just start by thanking uh, the Governor and Lieutenant Governor and Commissioner Persicelli um, 
for them working with us and around the clock to uh, respond um, with our institutions of higher education. We just held a conference call with colleges and universities this morning with the uh, uh, Commissioner Newworth, uh, Assistant Commissioner Newworth, and um, my office to respond to questions. They have been a tremendous resource to us, and I just want to thank them for that. We are aware that many institutions have made the decision to extend spring breaks, move classes online, or suspend study abroad programs. These decisions have been made by the institutions themselves, and we are here to support them. Uh, we understand that they made those decisions uh, to maintain health and safety of their college communities, and that's of utmost importance. And we know that they're making these careful considerations out of an abundance of caution. The most important thing that colleges can do right now is to plan and prepare. Institutions should follow the guidance that has been developed by the Department of Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and stay informed as up of updates as they become available. In addition, my office has developed guidance in consultation with the other relevant state agencies that include specific recommendations and considerations as the situation evolve, evolves for colleges. Particularly in making decisions that impact ca campus life, I urge institutions to consider how to make appropriate accommodations for students for whom college is their primary residence. I understand that most institutions in the state are keeping residence halls, food establishments, and other buildings open for this reason. If colleges have not already begun to do so, they should be reviewing and updating their emergency operations plans to outline how they would respond to a potential case and who would be involved in the response and how that information would be communicated during an emergency. In response to this evolving situation, we are asking that institutions send us the latest version of these plans by this Sunday, March 15th. We will be reviewing them with the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security. These plans should again include considerations and guidelines for handling basic needs for those who need it, such as housing and food, notifying the surrounding community, including municipal and county leadership and the local business community, and the decision making involved in reconvening in-person instruction. In general, if a community or institution has cases of COVID-19, local health officials will help identify those individuals and follow up with next steps. And institutions and colleges should begin to establish relationships with those local health officials now to identify potential uh, identify points of contact before a case is identified. The Department of Health has an easy to use interactive tool for that to help colleges and we're happy to assist in making those connections. Um, while many have done this already, the Department of Health recommends colleges postpone and or cancel study abroad programs that could expose students and staff to potential community spread of COVID-19 and assist students in their return home. Prior to traveling, institutions to consider the potential risks that are involved in visiting these destinations, including the risk of transmission and the risk of quarantine upon returning. Since the beginning of last month, my office has been working with the Department of Health through the state's coronavirus task force to monitor the global outreach outbreak and the impact it may have on our colleges and universities. We continue to meet weekly and we are working across the administration to communicate on a daily, if not hourly basis. Uh, we have our own internal uh, department coronavirus task uh, force response team that is now meeting daily as well and we are available to work with colleges that have questions. We've also conducted an audit of institutions emergency operations plans that we have on file. These plans are living documents and should be updated regularly and we're looking forward to reviewing the latest versions. Again, I would just say as this situation evolves and unfolds, we'll be continuing to work with the colleges and sharing any updated guidance that comes from the Department of Health in New Jersey, the CDC, or the World Health Organization. And I want to thank institutions who have been proactive and careful in their decision making as they navigate this very challenging situation. Um, I'm happy to turn it back over to the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith-Ellis. And uh, questions? You. Emergency doc, a department there, uh, Dr. James Pruden, and whether you can disclose 
that or not. Um, I wonder if you could just speak to, you know, a healthcare provider who may have been exposed either to a patient and that's how he got it, or did he goes elsewhere and, and then did he expose patients? You know, I'm just wondering when he when he stops seeing patients and if you've had conversations with that hospital because they are putting out statements saying we're following all the CDC guidelines in terms of personal protection. I can't contact on, I can't comment on that individual case, uh, particularly in the specificity that you gave. I can uh, tell you that um, all of our hospitals, we've had a series of meetings with them, all of our hospitals are um, using the appropriate precautions and at this point um, appear to have enough PPE uh, for the present cases that they're seeing. Our biggest concern, quite frankly, is the personal protective equipment over time. If a uh, surge occurs, which we expect it may, uh, I think we will be uh, uh, certainly uh, constrained in our availab availability of supplies. And that's something that uh, Chris is working on uh, with uh, the, the governor, who's um, intimately involved with making sure that we protect not only the residents of New Jersey, but very concerned about the, uh, the workforce. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you two cases that you said you couldn't currently find a link to a COVID-19 patient. I want to make sure you can phrase it correctly. Where are those located? How sure are you receiving communications from them? And what's your understanding of the situation in the hospital? Uh, I'm not aware of any specific cases that have been linked to COVID-19 patients. I don't know if there's any other cases that have been linked to COVID-19 patients. All good questions. Um, first of all, you have to understand we meet every day. I get these uh, broad reports about a half hour before we meet. So I do not have the specificity that you're asking for. But I, we always ask, is there right now an identified uh, exposure to COVID-19? That's how I was able to share that with you. So I, you know, perhaps tomorrow I would have more information. Because contact tracing, I think I've gone over this before, contact tracing takes a while, uh, and it relies on the condition of the patient and also uh, the uh, health officer and the treating physician uh, getting involved. Um, where's that watershed moment? That's a, that's a really good question, and we track it every day a number of times during the day, both in the morning the afternoon and uh, before uh, we all turn in at night, which is now around 11, 12 o'clock. Uh, I don't know where that turn is, but I know the epidemiologists will tell you that, that we want to respond sooner than later, and we will know when it's time to take our mitigation strategies to the next level. They do remind us that what happens in a certain community may not happen in another. So you could have uh, widespread uh, school closures in a certain county and not in you know, perhaps North Jersey and not one in South Jersey. So that's why we, we're watching it constantly. We have an, if you go on our dash, the dashboard is, is that published now or it will be? We have a dashboard, you're gonna be able to go in and it'll light up where all the cases are. And you'll be able to see, it's like a heat map, but you'll be able to see the spread in New Jersey and you'll be able to identify for yourself where there seems to be uh, m more uh, uh, of an issue. And we're looking at that constantly. So can you just see the I just want to follow on that point. So is it, what you seem to be saying is that you have two possible cases of, that might be community spread, but you haven't confirmed it yet? And we have, two poss po we have two cases where it's been documented that so far they cannot find a, an exposure to a positive COVID-19 case or uh, travel from it from an area that has community spread, which would be like Italy, Japan, South Korea. We just don't have enough information. It takes a while to build out these cases, and we'd like to give you real-time information. So I've been we've been rushing here every day. You'll see most of my notes are not nicely typed; they're written because I'm in the car getting information. Uh, so it's always going to be like a 24-hour delay for more in-depth information. Yeah.
can you provide detail, per se, which uh, counties uh, those two possible cases were from? We have four in Bur the new cases. No, 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 I'm sorry, the two possible cases. I don't have that. Don't yeah, know. I just know that we have two. Just one real quick question. Have you folks identified the school that the 17-year-old goes to? Uh, I don't. I don't have that. Yeah. Contact tracing uh, with a PUI, a person under investigation, starts at the time that they're screening the person under investigation. So, for example, if you show up in the emergency room and you say you've traveled from Italy and now you're symptomatic, you're not feeling well, in order to establish you as a person under investigation, your, the screening will start asking you the start of the questions of contact tracing. Where have you been? When did you travel from Italy? Were you in Milan or North Italy? Who did you visit when you were there? What plane did you get on? When you landed, who, how did you get home? Were you in a car by yourself? Were you with four people? How many people in your household? Is anyone else in your household showing symptoms? You've been asymptomatic. When did your symptoms start? That's all the. So we start that right away. Uh, so I don't want you to think it's like we wait. That in order to establish someone as, yeah, you've got to be tested, we've already started contact tracing. Yes. Uh, our goal right now is to restrict all visiting uh, on, uh, unless uh, there is a patient at uh, end of life or hospice and requires support or if there is a mental health condition uh, that would be worsened if uh, the visitor was not allowed in. Uh, however, no one will be allowed in if they have a fever, if they're coughing, if they um, have any respiratory uh, symptoms or similar to screening if they have traveled uh, from an area that has community spread or uh, have had, has had contact with someone uh, that is a COVID-19 uh, patient. Yes. Commissioner, could you take a step back and give us a little perspective? Um, we're talking about the possibility of community spread. This is not exactly a shock. Um, it's expected from what I understand. Um, I keep talking to people and they're like, what is the big deal? Why are we hysterical about this? It spreads like the flu. The death rates seem to be slightly higher, but we really don't know because many more people may be infected than we're aware of at this point because the testing has been extremely limited. And most people don't die. Many people don't even get that sick. Some of the people that have tested positive are not in the hospital. People are running out and buying soap, toilet paper, uh, stocking up on all kinds of things. Um, how big of a threat do you perceive this to be for the average person who is not immunosuppressed, extremely old, or I don't know what? I'm going to let uh, Dr. Tan respond to that because, you know, the biggest thing, and I, I want to make this comment before Dr. Tan starts, is there is no vaccine for this. That's number one. Number two, the treatment for, for the patient is the same whether they come in positive or negative because it's symptom they're treating the symptoms. And that, that's an interesting uh, difference from most situations. Usually you test positive, you treat in a certain way. We don't have any prescribed treatment at this point in time. So patients are treated uh, uh, supportive care. As the symptoms come up, their symptoms are treated. Dr. Tan, you want to talk about the epidemiological big deal? <laughs> 
Um, well, I actually just wanted to first uh, take a step back also and just kind of describe, I, this might have been touched upon before, but the concept of what we mean by risk, risk of um, uh, becoming ill versus risk of serious uh, illness, hospitalization, death. And again, just to hammer this particular point home, is that the current risk for um, the general public for um, development of COVID-19 illness is still low. There are, however, there are communities where we're seeing, um, you know, some of these sporadic cases that we're monitoring, um, uh, as well as pockets where we're seeing clustering of COVID-19 illnesses where if you're exposed to those communities, whether it's in New York or California, Washington, you're going to be at higher risk for actually getting COVID-19 because of the um, intensity of the virus, you know, being present in the community. Then you have the separate concept of risk vulnerability to becoming um, seriously ill, um, potentially being hospitalized or um, having death um, associated with COVID-19. And then, you know, that is again alluding to all the conversation about vulnerable populations. Uh, you know, we're talking about um, the um, older individuals. Um, we're talking about individuals with um, uh, weakened uh, immune systems, underlying medical conditions like heart, lung, kidney disease, diabetes. Um, so, so that's that concept. So what's the risk of the average person? So the risk of the average person really depends on what you're seeing from a um, local epidemiology perspective as far as where they might be, what they might be exposed to. But generally speaking, for the entire country, for you know all, all of New Jersey in certain depending on where you are, it's it's still a low risk. I don't mean to be, you know, silly about it, but if you guys came in every day and gave us the latest update on the number of flu cases, <coughs> hospitalizations, deaths, how would it compare to what we're seeing with COVID-19? Yeah, and, and again, the reason why we're also very concerned, too, is because this is a new... Mm -hmm situation that we're seeing and we're still in the process of trying to characterize what the scope of illness is and you know for that reason you know to the point that we're trying to develop uh, vaccines and other therapeutics we have to be really um, mindful and and you know do our best steps that we can to protect our New Jerseyans in general but thank you for the question about the scope in comparison to other um, illnesses influenza kills many, many individuals every single year. And we know that we see a lot of deaths here in New Jersey. It's not an, a reportable condition in New Jersey because it's just such, it's, it's so widely um, impacts New Jersey. That's why we follow what's called influenza-like illness just to monitor trends. And then what we see in the community every single year is usually you start with a sporadic activity in one geographic area and then it kind of just spreads out. But that's our opportunity to give the messages to get vaccinated, get, uh, if you haven't already gotten vaccinated, everybody, you know, I'd like to see everybody raise their hand who has gotten the flu shot this year. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then, um, but then also, you know, the issue about making sure that you take those everyday prevention steps that have been emphasized time and again. Yeah. The CDC has not given us any confirmatory results yet, uh, nor have we received an explanation as to the, the as to the delay. Yes. That's really, really great comments and excellent question. We talk every day at the Department of Health um, about the appropriateness of the information that we share with all of you. Um, we take into consideration, obviously, HIPAA uh, violations. We also look at our statutes that identify the types of information we can give. And they said, they said the statute says very clearly it should be information that advances the cause of public health in New Jersey. Uh, part of uh, us releasing information down to the specificity of uh, particularly the counties is for the public of those counties to be aware that there is a case uh, in their county 
and they should step up their own personal hygiene um, uh, situation that they should you know wash their hands and stay home if they're sick all the things we've been warning people about um, at this point as this increases I think um, knowing county spread is probably valuable enough from a public health uh, perspective uh, but that's my own opinion but your your question is well put because we challenge ourselves every day at the Department of Health is what is the appropriate information to give to the to everyone uh, to advance our mission of public health. Yeah. Um, on this question of risk, I, I notice, for example, every day we've done these briefings with this uh, public service announcement that general public is at low risk. We didn't do that for that. I was wondering if that's related to the possibility that you might have as indications of possible community spread. The second part is, I, I guess, how much how do you square your, your ability to say that there's a low risk of, of catching this when we had this problem, well-documented problem with a lack of tests? But we don't really have adequate tests out there to measure the extent of this problem. Well, the reason I didn't come out with that statement is because I keep telling my communications people that they give me the same words to say over and over again, so I would rather, uh, uh, but um, I, I'm, I'm with Dr. Tan. We do believe that uh, generally the overall risk is low, but again, you may bring up some excellent points. When we don't have uh, a good, um, uh, when we don't have good numbers, good numerators and denominators uh, assessing um, the, the percentage of risk and the percentage of population that has uh, coronavirus, how many of them, it's, it's, um, it's suggested that 80, 85 percent of them will be home and feeling flu-like symptoms and doing well, 15 percent will end up in the uh, hospital, and a very small percentage of that, uh, 15 percent, uh, will uh, go on to be extremely ill or uh, expire. We don't have, it's a novel virus. The, the concern is because it's a novel virus. And when something new is um, exhibited in humans, we follow it very carefully, uh, but it's difficult to make overall assumptions. But, you know, it's a big population, and at this point, um, I think we still think that the, the risk is low. Um, yeah, but we're watching it. I, I can't sugarcoat that. Yes. You? Commissioner, can you talk about, do you know how long it takes from the onset of the disease for it to kind of cycle through and when people, um, I guess for lack of a better word, become healthy again? And have you seen any of the previous cases that you've talked about? Have those people come through and, and been determined to be healthy? I think I'll let Dr. Tan uh, take that. Um, to address the first question, I think what you're referring to is um, when uh, people might become ill from the point that they're exposed. Is that what you're asking? How long have people said for? I mean, how long does it take to get better? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so the duration of illness really depends. Um, some individuals might have mild illness that lasts several days, while unfortunately some other individuals who are in, uh, who unfortunately have complications associated with COVID-19 who might require hospitalization, it could uh, the duration of the uh, the, uh, the treatment, the the um, clinical course, might be much longer. Um, sorry, I can't elaborate too much more on that. It's it's a range. Yes. Have any, sorry, have any, have, have any of the people who have been tested positive have they have they been determined to be healthy? Yeah, or are they all still in the throes of the? Um, I I don't have any of that information for the New Jersey residents. Yes. Yes. Um, first of all, I don't have any of the conditions. Uh, uh, as I explained, we just got this information. Uh, so I have nothing, if I, I don't have anything more uh, in the case histories. But one of the things we will be looking at, particularly for the uh, six that um, have a, a reported type of exposure, exactly whether that's with any other uh, individual in New Jersey. Uh, but I just don't have that today. Uh, question for the health folks. Um, sort of a two-part question. 
hand sanitizers and wipes, disinfectant. Um, is there stuff uh, for the hand sanitizers? Uh, are some of them more effective than others? Is there a particular ingredient in a particular strength that we're looking for that kills viruses that we know? And with regard to the disinfectant stuff that you put on a banister or a tabletop or whatever, um, you just slap it on and wipe it off? You leave it on? I mean, I, at New Rochelle, they were showing video of people washing down the train station. They'd spray it and then wipe it, and that would be the end of it. Um, okay, for hand sanitizer, um, we like to see, uh, and we recommend 60% alcohol or higher. Uh, for uh, disinfectant, if you go on our website, we do have guidance for disinfectant. Uh, my understanding is that the um, uh, disinfectants that uh, uh, public institutions use uh, is more than adequate. Um, we just ask them to amplify their, uh, their uh, cleaning. In other words, do it more times during the day than maybe they would normally do it. I've been told, and I've read on some of the instructions on these labels, that you're supposed to leave the stuff on for four minutes. Well, they should follow the instructions. Could you just discuss that maybe different products may have different guidance about that? Or? On our um, guidance, it identifies all the products. Uh, that are acceptable and uh, appropriate for uh, coronavirus. I don't, I, I, I didn't connect. I don't know. Where do people get that? You uh, go on our website, New Jersey Department of Health. Okay. Yes. Um, you mentioned the PPE problem in terms of supplies, if there's a surge, and how that will likely be a problem. I just wanted to call to see what, if anything, can be done about that. I don't know if there's a good question. And just uh, sort of link to that. Is we did interview a, a patient at the HMC, and he painted not a great picture of, of the level of preparedness and protection that the healthcare providers there were wearing. He said it, it took him five days to get into isolation. So I don't know how much time to look at those, but in terms of the protection. <clears throat> well, I certainly can't speak to the circumstances around that case you're referring to. But of course, in a public health crisis where um, our frontline health care providers and acute care facilities, long-term care facilities and EMS agencies are doing their best to ensure their workforce are protected, um, you know, with a supply chain, um, you know, with a stress on the supply chain, you know, from, uh, from all directions, um, there's going to be issues around ensuring that um, the supply of PPE is readily available and sufficient enough for those individuals who need to use it. And so we're working with healthcare facilities of all types to ensure that they have strategies in place um, to conserve the available PPE that they do have on hand. Um, the CDC has promulgated guidance um, specifically around using alternate uh, PPE, including face mask respirators, um, so that individuals who are performing um, in invasive procedures that generate respiratory aerosols are using the higher level of PPE like N95s. We're also using expired material um, for training and education purposes so that they don't use um, unexpired materials. And there's a whole host of strategies that are available on our website um, that we uh, encourage acute care facilities, long-term care facilities, and EMS agencies um, to review and begin incorporating, in, uh, incorporating that um, technical guidance into their plans if they haven't done so already. Yes, Brenda. Uh, generally, I think um, large-scale um, uh, gatherings um, in close quarters would be the general guideline. Um, a political rally. Yeah, at this, at this point, I think people need to make their own decisions based on the guidance that we're giving them, which is to be careful about being near people. Um, you know, don't, don't sit next to someone that is sniffling and coughing. If someone is, move. Uh, if you don't feel well, stay home. Um, if it's, uh, and I'm, I'm not kidding when I say close quarters, um, you, know, you know that um, concerts are close quarters and people are, you know, 
enjoying the concert, but also singing and coughing, um, things like that. I mean, it, you just don't want to expose yourself uh, on a general basis to that, uh, but definitely uh, right now. Yes. Does the state have a plan to allow state workers uh, to work from home, and is the state set up for something? If, that, if there is a plan, is the state set up for something that would be widespread? Um, as, as we are speaking, uh, the head of our Civil Service Commission, who has oversight you know, over the, the workforce, they uh, are developing uh, precisely what you, you are asking. In addition, our Office of Information Technology is gearing up uh, if we have to begin to have employees work from home, we're making sure that we will have ability for people to have ac access to our systems, um, you know, within our, within our mainframe. So uh, yes and yes would be my answer to you. Yes. We gave that guidance to all of them, and statewide. Okay. And so today we're hearing about these neighborhood cases yesterday was four. Have we reached the point yet where this virus, the number of cases, could increase exponentially? Or I mean, we really don't know. You know, we, we look at what's going on in the rest of the country, and, you know, you can't ignore what happened in Washington State in the long-term care facility. Um, and the vulnerability of those patients uh, is so obvious. Um, we're erring on the side of caution um, to the degree that it does not affect the patients. Um, hold off the visitors for a while. And I don't want to oversimplify things, but how much is community spread almost like a circuit breaker? Yeah, I think it is. That's my, my opinion, Dr. Tan. Yeah, I mean, we talk every day. And again, you know, we're, this is, this is a, a situation where we're looking at cases, we're looking at the contacts, we're looking at where they're located, uh, and trying to put in as many protections as we can. Yes, I want to go back um, to the question about um, employees and working from home policies. So I've asked Matt Placken to, uh, who has worked on those policies, to uh, further elaborate on that question. Just to clarify, Matt, we issued, the Civil Service Commission yesterday issued, following the governor's executive order on Monday, issued guidelines to all state employees uh, regarding flexible leave policies, as well as directed all departments to uh, update their continuance of operations plans, their coops, as it's called. Uh, we've set a deadline for as late as noon on Monday, but preferably earlier for them to update those plans. In those plans, it will designate both essential and non-essential employees, as well as create plans for uh, work from home policies. So we are uh, very actively engaged on it. Yes. Have we had a single case of a college student in New Jersey being diagnosed as having novel coronavirus? Uh, and if the end, whatever the answer is, is there a concern that maybe the colleges, <clears throat> yeah, you want to be erring on the side of caution, but to start doing everything online and just telling kids not to show up in classes and so forth. Is that really warranted at this point or not? Doctor? Well, I'll let you speak to the colleges. Yeah, yeah I, I don't have that information. Okay. I, I, it, it doesn't come to mind, which leads me to believe that at this point, perhaps not. But. I think, um, as you all know, the colleges are all autonomous and independent to determine when they're going to be open and closed, when they're going to have spring break and things of that nature. I think uh, they're doing these things out of an abundance of caution, and we want to support them in um, doing what they believe is best for the well-being of the students on campus. We are giving them guidance about what to do if and when there might be a case, how to appropriately quarantine students, things of that nature. Uh, yes, Charles. Yes. Oh, I, I just, I'm sorry, if it, following up on your earlier response, you expressed confidence that there, there's a low risk, but can you, how, where is the source of that confidence based on, I mean, what is it, it's just simply because the population is spread out? I, I'm not sure, I'm not clear as to where, where your confidence lies at there, at the people are low risk, or one of those populated countries I'm going to let Dr. Tan um, uh, help me with that one. 
Yeah, you know, uh, it's it is a difficult um, uh, scenario to characterize. You know, what we do know right now is that we have several individuals who have known contacts with COVID-19 cases. So, you know, we know we recognize that you know those contacts those are clustering around other known cases. There are others that we're still trying to identify what that source of exposure is right now. However, at this time, we're still seeing kind of like sporadic cases throughout um, various regions in our state. You know, certainly as we monitor and as we start to identify more cases, we'll be able to have a better sense of, you know, really, you know, is there going to be additional spread around a particular uh, geographic area, geographic region? So. It's, it, you know, it really depends. I, I know people hate that answer, it depends, but it really depends on what we're seeing, what the context of the case might be. We have, like, as I just mentioned, you know, when you have individuals who are clustered around other cases, that's a different scenario than just an individual who might uh, have an unknown source. Many of our communicable diseases, we don't ever identify a source. So where else could they have, co uh, have it come from, from the community? However, what we're concerned about is looking at society sustained spread, sustained um, community spread in the community where, you know, we, then we kind of have to re reconsider or, um, you know, kind of reinforce some of those community mitigation efforts. Yes. Um, let me start with someone who's died who hadn't been uh, tested. Um, if, if the person expired from a pneumonia of undetermined uh, source and perhaps uh, had no other comorbid uh, conditions, and you would wonder why, why did this person uh, have this particular condition, uh, that might be something that the medical examiner would look at. Um, the, the first part of your th about Little Lake Harbor. I know I can't speak to that. I, I, I just, it's important uh, to remember that right now New Jersey is still using the, the CDC's criteria for persons under investigation um, as the threshold for individuals that we're testing at the state lab. Yes. Uh, let's start with the second part. Um, I think we'll get to the point where all mild cases, mo even moderate cases, just think of yourselves, if you've ever had the flu, can stay home. And they should stay home because taking up a hospital bed, if you do not have a severe illness um, or you don't need a, an intensive service, a severity of illness, intensity of service determines whether you should be admitted to a hospital. So we believe that a lot of mild and moderate cases um, will definitely stay home uh, because they will not need um, hospitalization um, at all. Um, and probably don't even need to be tested. They'd just be symptomatic uh, treatment, um, similar to uh, a lot of other uh, issues. And the first part, well, this, the surge is really interesting, and we've met a number of times with the hospitals particularly, because a surge in hospitalized uh, patients that require hospitalization uh, is uh, what uh, we would be most concerned about. So I think you've heard me say before, we've done an inventory of our negative pressure rooms, and we know we have capacity for 700 uh, cases. Uh, the, uh, the hospitals all have uh, emergency preparedness plans that look at that resiliency. They've all identified what stockpiles they have of personal um, 
uh, protective equipment, and um, I'm talking uh, repeatedly, constantly, almost every day with the head of the hospital association, so we keep very much uh, informed, uh, and we're looking at um, surges in the emergency room, which is the biggest issue right now, people coming in, the worried well, that want to be tested. I understand why they're there, they're scared. Uh, but on the other hand, it's really, um, you know, with MTALA, we need to see every patient, triage every patient, see every patient. Uh, so we're looking at some alternatives for um, surge um, um, uh, EDs uh, that can be easily uh, constructed around the state if we need it. We already have um, two that we know are already licensed. They were licensed uh, uh, during a prior um, <clears throat> epidemic and uh, they're prepared to um, go online. So we're looking at more of that. So it's uh, something we're looking at day by day. Okay, uh, if, uh, are there any more questions from the media? Yes. I don't know the school question. Um, I just is just from memory. Um, I think uh, two maybe, uh, uh, but we do have healthcare workers that are home on quarantine um, and being followed by the local health officers. But I don't have a number. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, this is going to conclude today's briefing. And do you have one? Is, do you have um, a timeline on when you? Yeah, we do. It's evolving. I look at it. We, we look at it day by day. And, and I'm not being glib when I say hour by hour. It's when things occur and we map it, we look at it. We determine the, um, you know, where it's coming from, the exposures. So it's really a day by day situation. And as I said, we could have it in the north part of the state and not the south part of the state. So there's not going to be a blanket at this point, a blanket. Oh, um, I hope to get um, more information on these cases. It takes about 24, 48 hours. And to say that there is community spread, you just need that one person that you don't know the connection, either to a place of travel or a person who had it. That That's the start of the investigation of, well, why did this person get it? Is it this is person-to-person -person transmission? Are there other person-to-person -person transmissions in this particular community where we cannot find a documented exposure? It, it's a... But is there, like, a number, like, you have to have... No, 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 no. Yes. Commissioner, if somebody is, uh, your, your, the guidance is go self-quarantine or they go to, they get tested, they're positive, but then they're not really showing many symptoms and they're sent home. <laughs> is there a specific length of time, like beyond the 14 days, are they then clear to live a normal life or? Well, definitely they can live a normal life, but I think there's serial testing afterwards. Yeah. Currently, there is a uh, clearance process. Um, CDC has some guidance uh, with regard to COVID-19 cases that um, you know we would monitor um, individuals after the resolution of their symptoms, and we would monitor, um, do some serial testing. We do anticipate that there might be some changes in the guidance coming up um, pretty soon. So, that, and and again, I, I'm not trying to be vague. It's just that I that you know we recognize that there might be some changes in the um, in the guidance for the medical clearance because as we get more cases. Is as we get more information about what medical clearance means, um, that, that modifies what that is. Right now, somebody can go back to work? Um, after they're medically cleared, yeah. And, and it, it so actually... Medically cleared, though, right after the 14-day period? There, 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 is, um, there is supposed to be some serial testing that's done, but that's in the process of being reevaluated right now, especially in the context of, you know, the, the testing considerations right now about where we prior prioritize doing the testing. But I did want to mention, um, uh, just on a, a related note, about um, individuals who are in self-quarantine. After asymptomatic individuals who are asked to self-quarantine complete their 14 days, no risk to 
uh, at people when they go back to work. And so it's really important if you all can get that message out there that, you know, because we want to limit stigmatization, we want to make sure that people get back in the community as soon as they can. And, you know, we're, we're sometimes encountering that and we're sometimes seeing that. So again, individuals who are self-quarantined, who after they complete their um, quarantine period, 14 days after the last exposure, no problems going back into the community. I just want to clarify, I think uh, the person said just one person uh, mean community spread. No, that's sporadic. I want to make that clear. One person does not. It would be yeah. a cluster. Mm -hmm. I want to follow up on two cases that you mentioned over the weekend, I believe on Sunday, I think it was case number five and six. At the time on Sunday, you had mentioned that they were not healthy enough or not in the condition to be able to have an interview with these investigators. Has that changed? Have you been able to talk to these individuals who were in pretty bad shape over the weekend? Yeah, I don't have that information. I have not heard that they uh, cannot be uh, traced. Um, that's done by the local health officers. As you can imagine, their local health officers are just that, they're local, and they're doing their work and then feeding it into our communicable disease uh, service. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't keep track of all of that personally, but it is taken care of. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.